Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Young Athletes Short Season, What About Recovery? Brought to you by Sports Health at NYU Langone. Before we begin, please take a moment to mute your computer microphone or telephone. If you would like to submit a question to any of our speakers tonight, please type it in the Q&A box on the bottom corner of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can later on in the presentation. Tonight's webinar will also be recorded and published on NYU Langone's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash NYULMC. I'm now pleased to turn it over to tonight's moderator, Dr. Dennis Cardone, who will share a little about his background and role at NYU Langone, as well as introduce you to our panel of experts. Welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to have you on board and uh, we truly have a great uh, segment and a great panel for you tonight and uh, talking about such a relevant topic, the young athlete short season. I mean, we certainly are in unprecedented times in terms of our young athletes and return to sport. So again, um, without further ado, let's start to introduce everyone. Again, my name is uh, Dr. Dennis Cardone and I'm here within the NYU Langone uh, Orthopedic Department and uh, I am the medical director for the New York City High Schools, the Public Schools Athletic League, team physician for NYU, uh, LIU, and College of Mount St. Vincent. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to our panel. So let's get that going. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chris Napoli. Hey, Chris. Good evening, everybody. I'm Chris Napoli, athletic trainer for NYU Langone uh, Hospital, Long Island. Currently the athletic trainer at Garden City High School. Um, sit as the player safety coordinator for USA Hockey for the New York District, as well as a medical consultant for Major League Soccer. Um, thankful to be here tonight. All right, thanks, Chris. Josh, say hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Joshua Hanrado. I'm an athletic trainer with the Harkness Center for Dance Injuries at NYU Langone Health. I've been with NYU for five years now, primarily work with our on-site companies, Dance Street of Harlem, Complexions of Moan, Paul Taylor, Dance Street of Harlem, as well as our Broadway shows such as Wicked. Um, I also dabble in a little bit of research and um, provide education to the dance community as well as the dance medicine community. Welcome and pleasure to be here. Great, thanks, Josh. Nicole? Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Regan. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. I work for NYU Langone Pediatric Endocrinology on Long Island, and I have some experience working with the athletes over at LIU Post on their nutrition. Thanks for having us. All right, and, and finally, the leader bringing up the rear, Bonnie Marks. Hi, I'm Bonnie. Uh, I work at Rusk Rehabilitation. I've been there about 19 years. I work in brain injury and also um, sports center uh, and concussion center. And uh, I work with athletes at all levels and dan including dancers. And also I, I'm a guide at the Achilles Club for the New York City Marathon. Thank you. All right, that's fantastic. And it also, in case you didn't know, this is actually National Athletic Training Month, National Nutrition Month in March, and Youth Sport Safety Month in April. So there couldn't, again, be a better time to discuss these topics. So with that, let's get it started. And, and let's start with a question that I've certainly heard a lot of from coaches. And uh, that is, how can I help prepare my athletes for the abbreviated preseason? Josh, maybe you should get us started talking about something like fitness and general fitness. Sure. So getting an athlete started um, even before preseason is definitely important, especially since we do have the shorter um, seasons. So the Center for Disease Control, believe it or not, even um, published guidelines before COVID. Um, they recommended for adolescents ages 6 to 17 um, that they should have at least one hour of moderate activity um, and that, uh, per day. And um, this activity potentially can be three days of aerobic activity to work on that cardiorespiratory system. And then the other three days can potentially be um, building muscle. So more of your climbing 
um, push-ups, so on and so forth. So even before preseason, making sure that your athletes are obtaining just this general baseline of activity will set them up um, for that preseason. We could also talk about potentially cross-training. Um, you potentially can have your athlete do yoga or Pilates or, or some other form of activity. Um, yoga potentially can help increase their flexibility. If you know you have an athlete who is super tight, recommending to them that they do yoga even before their preseason. Um, and if, they, if you have an athlete that kind of just needs to build general strength all around, especially in the core region, Pilates is a good form of cross training. Then even within, um, before that preseason or within that preseason as well, you do want to recommend um, to start incorporating sports specific activities. I know a lot of sports out there are um, a little finicky. They might have rules restrictions about organized activity even before your preseason. But what this might potentially look like for a dancer, um, for example, one of these hours, um, they potentially can take an at-home dance class. Um, if you have a basketball athlete, one of these hours per day, they potentially can just shoot hoops. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be organized activity, but incorporating some form of sports specific activity within even their before preseason um, would be beneficial for them. Josh, so we have athletes who potentially for the first time in their lives, we're seeing young athletes who have not done activity, significant activity, maybe for nine months, 10 months. And now, and I'll give you the example is say the New York City public schools and the high schools, you know, now we're having, it sounds, you know, four weeks to get them ready potentially for a season, young athletes. So, you know, we've, we've never been in this territory before. Are, are there any specific concerns from say a cardiovascular, pulmonary, or even just from a musculoskeletal perspective about this hyper revved up getting back to sport. And, and I throw this out to you or Chris. Yeah, absolutely, Chris, you could definitely um, expand, but there is definitely potential for injury if we increase our activity too quickly. So um, this brings up the idea of progressive overload. So following the CDC's basic guidelines of at least having some form of moderate to vigorous physical activity one hour a day um, will help ensure that you get that athlete back into activity. Um, and then from there, you wanna progressively increase the amount of sport specific activity you have during that preseason. Yeah, Josh, and just to add on to that, some of the big things that I notice, especially with our high school athletes and dealing with the, such of a short preseason, uh, we're currently out here on Long Island in our uh, entering our week four of football, uh, so it's five weeks that we've been in. Uh, a lot of students, when they are getting ready for their preseason, they focus just on their endurance. They go out for their mile run, their two-mile run, because that's what the coach is going to test them on when it comes to uh, their tryouts. One of the biggest things that we need to uh, incorporate uh, from a coach's perspective as well as from an athlete perspective is getting the multi-directional movements uh, in place. So if you're playing soccer, if you're playing football, it's never a, a forward and backward straight line. It's always cutting that's going on. And there's where we start to see most of our injuries occur um, from not only cutting, but also from um, acceleration and deceleration um, is where we're going to start seeing a lot of our our, our hamstring strains and our, our quad strains and, and any sort of muscle strain. So Chris, we're, we're gonna move on. But with that said, you're about two to three weeks at least ahead of us here in the city. Any specific injuries that you're seeing um, that would be very different than typical at the beginning of a, let's say with football, then at the beginning of a typical football season in August, what are you seeing different this, this go around? Um, this go around right now, I can tell you the strains that we're seeing is through the roof. A lot of overuse, uh, especially in our, our high school athletes, seeing a lot of um, tendonitis cases that are that are occurring. Um, and, and unfortunately, we are seeing a lot more fractured dislocations um, that have occurred. Um, you know, so far, we're, we're four weeks in, and I've seen uh, one too many fractures and dislocations occur uh, compared to previous years. 
we're, we're absolutely going to get back to that and, uh, and, and have conversation about that. Let's go, let's go to Nicole. Nicole, so, you know, again, very different from a nutritional perspective. You know, what um, these athletes have not been conditioning, have been at home, uh, maybe hitting that refrigerator one too many times, uh, much more than they were previously. How, how do we prepare the athlete from a nutritional perspective? Yeah, so I think to prepare for this season, coaches should encourage their athletes to get back on track with healthy eating and a normal meal schedule. Uh, since the pandemic, many of us have fallen out of routine. Some of us have gained unwanted weight or developed unhealthy eating habits due to the circumstances. You know, like Josh said, we've all been very sedentary indoors, you know, virtual schooling. There were, you know, no sports this past fall and winter. Um, and then at home, we have 24-7 direct access to the kitchen, which I think has led to frequent snacking, some boredom, mindless, and stress eating. Um, due to lack of a structured meal schedule at home, I'm seeing many teams skipping meals and instead grazing on snacks throughout the day, not always choosing the best sources for fuel. So coaches encourage athletes to have three balanced meals a day and at least a snack or two um, rather than skipping meals. And athletes should start planning meals and snacks for school, you know, quick breakfast options for the morning, lunches and pre-practice snacks to pack from home and post-workout recovery foods for after practice before dinner. And to touch upon what Chris mentioned um, with the fractures, I think an important nutrient to optimize preseason is calcium to decrease the risk of stress fractures and bone injuries. Um, athletes should aim for three dairy servings or calcium fortified dairy alternatives per day. Otherwise they may need to supplement. Um, the RDA for ages nine to 18 is 1300 milligrams of calcium per day. You know, I, the, you know, there's certainly some concerns that I would think of right from, a, you know, with again, in this, in this strange times that we're in and athletes returning back to sport in such a quick period of time. And, you know, I think about sports typically like wrestling, for example, where in the past they tried to drop weight so quickly to, to get in condition. And, and we've had some good stops along the way of bounce and checks to, to prevent some of the you know, unhealthy habits. But I think this is something that we need to be on top of now for all the athletes who really, like we said, might've put on some weight during, during the pandemic and now will try to lose it too quickly. Let's, let's turn up, Bonnie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to you, Bonnie. And what about also, you know, the psychological component, I think we're only understanding that and in our athletes much more now than we have in the past across the board with whether it comes to injury or whatever it is, um, you know, there's a, a lot of stress under athletes and especially here too now, they've been home um, and maybe it's just stressful to return to sport on multiple levels. Oh yeah, the, um, there's a there's a number of strategies they can use to stay motivated. Certainly the mental health uh, issues have been uh, predominant lately, especially um, depression, anxiety. And I think that it's all related to uncertainty uh, or unstable times. And so one of the ways that I think about motivation is to have a structure. Uh, if, if the teams, if the coaches can encourage structure, uh, as Nicole was saying, you know, our structure, you know, <laughs> our routine is non-routine has been. So, you know, it's time to get back into routine and, and develop a structure to stay motivated to train and, um, and to plan for it and uh, set goals for it to stay motivated uh, to work out at home. And, uh, and then we're all, I was also thinking that the coaches may want to encourage the teamwork. You know, there are apps where uh, you know, the individual athlete can log in their workouts and then that can motivate another athlete to get started or, and they can, you know, give each other supporting comments back and forth. So anything to, to encourage camaraderie among the teams, because I think isolation has been a real, a real killer. I mean, uh, the isolation piece has just been uh, very sad. The teenage suicide is up and the rates have gone up. And, and so I think it's the isolation. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that contribute, uh, things that contribute to that. But um, also if coaches gave positive feedback on you know, the workouts that they're doing, I think that um, there's a lot that can be done to bring them back in and to foster that team spirit and to get them involved 
and 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 establish some kind of consistency in their life. Yeah, no, certainly the pandemic has been difficult for all, for everyone. But when you think about our, our youth, especially, uh, it's just been a, a, a terrible time, both you know socially, athletically, uh, academically. It's really it's really been difficult. Mm -hmm. Let's move on, and uh, I think this this is perfect, Chris. I'm going to turn this one over to you because it kind of builds on what we were talking about before. So, for, from a parent of a young athlete, how can I help prevent overtraining, overuse injuries? when my child is participating in back-to-back -back season or year round? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. Uh, it's constantly seen in a high school where we have kids that are currently, um, use soccer for an example, it's in season now in high school, but they're also playing on a club team uh, where they're going, you know, twice a day, sometimes seven, eight, you know, 14 days in a row with no off days. Um, some of the stuff, conversations I've had with parents, it's okay to let them have an off day, um, to let their bodies just be human. We constantly um, get into our athletic mindset of, uh, of our child being an athletic robot where they wake up, they go to school, they play their sport, they come home, they go to their club sport. Um, so it's really important that as a parent, we're listening to what our children are saying. Um, if they're complaining that their body's hurting, just don't ignore it, all right? That's usually a sign that they're starting to break down, all right? Treat them to a day of relaxation um, where they can just go ahead and get out there and just be a kid. Um, and that's one of the biggest things that I see that we're starting to miss here because we're trying to make up for lost time in the pandemic that we need to get them to constantly play um, enough to make up for the past year that, that we've lost. You know, exactly. And, and we talk about you know, we talk about sports specialization, especially in our young athletes and the problems that it leads to, but here is unique, right? So here, if we talk about that 30 day preparation till they're in season, right? They haven't done anything for months on end. So to throw in recovery days, we know how important it is, but now try to convince potentially, you know, the athlete themselves that, hey, you know, I haven't done anything for, for so long and now I need every single day to train and get back to sport. So even though it may be a shortened preseason and it may just be a single sport and maybe it's just three or four weeks, no doubt there's, they're going to be susceptible to these overtraining, overuse type injuries unless there is some type of recovery. And you mentioned days off, right? Any, any other tips uh, in terms of recovery? Um, building off of that, um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics, they actually put out a position statement as well. They recommended um, specifically one or two days off per week, um, at least, as well as three months of time off throughout the entire year. Right now, it's, it's hard to gauge where that three months is going to come from. Um, but in general, there should be this amount of rest and recovery um, thinking bigger macro cycle throughout an athlete's career. Um, and you also mentioned um, Dr. Cardone about, um, what was it, youth specialization. Um, so the National Athletic Trainers Association, they actually put out a position statement about um, sports specialization and they recommended delaying specialization as um, long as possible because research actually has found that specializing early um, actually increases the propensity for chronic injury just because you're doing the same repetitive motion over and over. Um, and it doesn't necessarily um, guarantee that you're gonna become a professional in that sport. Along similar lines, um, they do recommend only being a part of one team at a time. Again, you don't want to do too much activity um, and then again, a final recommendation from the National Athletic Trainers Association is that um, they don't recommend doing more hours than your age. Um, so if you are 12 years old, not doing 12, not doing more than 12 hours of um, organized activity per week. So staying within that um, hour range limits will help decrease the potential for these chronic injuries. Bonnie, what about, you started to mention a bit before, but 
you know, we do see it and, and sometimes it's, it's disguised very well and we kind of need to look for it in our athletes, but overtraining or, or burnout syndrome. How, do, how could we give us some hints about how to recognize it and maybe some treatment hints? Yeah, uh, burnout, you know, I can see that with the, the injuries, the kinds of injuries that Chris had mentioned, I can, I can also uh, imagine the burnout uh, at some point, you know, down the road. But um, I think there's a number of things that, you know, the symptoms of burnout would be a pes pessimism or, or sometimes you see an all or nothing kind of attitude, uh, a fear of injury or fear of re-injury, uh, chronic stress can lead to burnout. And also, um, you know, the stigma that comes along with mental health issues. If a teenage teenager is uh, feeling, you know, uh, depressed or anxious, they're, they're afraid to go for help or what will their friends think? What will their teammates think? So all these things can uh, cause burnout. But I think mindfulness is one of the um, remedies for burnout. Um, you know, just, uh, just it reduces rumination. You know, just being present in the moment, practicing that, practicing guided meditations. I, my favorite's Insight Timer. And, uh, but there's a lot of, free apps and even minimal cost apps, uh, Calm and Headspace. But I like Insight Timer because it offers over 50,000 guided meditations and they're all free. Um, and for every, you know, if there's a sleep problem or anxiety or uh, grief or, um, you know, performance, uh, there's, there's, there's a meditation for everything and they're, usually, and they're guided. So, but also we find the studies have shown, the research has shown that mindfulness also improves your focus and uh, can improve your performance, but particularly the focus. Um, it also reduces emotional reactivity. So uh, what I mean by that is that if someone is uh, irritated um, and, and they make, they're making mistakes, uh, a young athlete might just, you know, get very angry or want to retaliate, but um, but it reduces the emotional reactivity. It helps them stay calmer, and they're able to um, to move away from that feeling of agitation. And also, it improves cognition, um, mindfulness, um, cognitive flexibility. Um, I think it's important for uh, coaches and parents to try to cultivate optimism because it increases resilience and that can also help prevent burnout. Um, parents can help prevent it by just listening carefully to their athlete, providing encouragement after mistakes, uh, a lot of encouragement throughout the injury, of course, uh, recognizing pro progress, even in small steps, tiny steps, baby steps, um, and also uh, including their, their young athlete uh, to participate in decision making. So these are some of the ways of helping to prevent burnout. And again, it's something that we need to, you know, we all need to be aware of and be on the lookout for. And certainly for, you know, for coaches and parents and athletes themselves, especially if there's one, one time to think of it, if there's a decrease in performance, you know, if they're just suddenly uh, not performing at a level where they were before, oftentimes burnout uh, could be the cause of that. So something we always need to think about. Nicole, what about from a nutrition perspective? Any, any guidelines or anything maybe for specific types of injuries or injury in general mm -hmm. about this overtraining, overuse injuries? Maybe some nutritional guidelines? Yes. Uh, athletes participating in multiple seasons should maintain a nutritious diet on a daily basis to really maximize their nutrient stores rather than ramping up nutrition once an injury occurred. Uh, proper fueling pre and post workouts can help prevent injury. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later, but when injury strikes, optimal nutrition can maximize the speed of recovery by, you know, controlling inflammation providing nutrients for rebuilding injured tissue and preserving muscle strength. Uh, specifically, an athlete wants to make sure they're getting adequate calories uh, during an injury to prevent the breakdown of skeletal muscle mass. Calorie needs are higher during healing, up to 20%. So this is not a time to restrict calories or diet, even though they're less active. Carbohydrate and fat intake should be adequate in order to reserve protein for muscle repair. Um, at this time, I would emphasize higher fiber complex carbs like whole grains, fruits, veggies, beans, um, and limit added sugars and concentrated sweets. 
your simple carbs really are better for immediately before exercise for quick fuel. Uh, fats should come mostly from unsaturated forms, things like nuts, seeds, avocado, olive oil, and fatty fish, uh, rich in omega-3s to help manage inflammation. Increased protein intake during injury will help athletes heal and repair muscle tissue while reducing muscle loss. And you actually want to emphasize the protein, uh, proteins high in the amino acid leucine to help stimulate protein synthesis faster. And this comes from whey protein, cheeses, meats, and fish. And you want to make sure you incorporate protein at each meal. Now, there are some vitamins and minerals for injury recovery that are specific to the type of injury, like you mentioned, Dr. Cardone. Um, so if you have a bone injury, you want to pay attention to your calcium intake to uh, support your bone structure. Again, that's those three dairy servings a day. Um, vitamin D to help absorb the calcium. So you might want to have your labs checked and correct for any deficiencies that might be present. Vitamin K2, which is found in animal products, is important for bone healing. And phosphorus and magnesium um, make up the structural components of bones. Phosphorus you get from dairy and magnesium from nuts, seeds, and legumes. Now, if you have a concussion, uh, protein is important for cell and tissue repair. Um, you want to emphasize magnesium and zinc-rich foods because actually these nutrient levels drop immediately following a concussion. So magnesium, again, from those nuts and seeds and zinc mostly from your animal products. Um, Omega-3s are good for brain and cognitive function to help reduce inflammation. And antioxidants, vitamins A, C, and E from your healthy fats, fruits, and veggies help protect against oxidative stress, which is important um, for the brain there. Lastly, if you have a tendon or ligament injury, you want to consume collagen or gelatin, which comes in either, you know, powder or packet forms. Collagen is a, you know, building block for muscle, skin, tendons, and ligaments. Um, you also want to get vitamin C, which plays a role in collagen formation and tissue repair. And actually, copper is another key nutrient for tendon health found in shellfish, seeds, nuts, and even chocolate. Mm, I like that. Um... <laughs> And magnesium can help with uh, headaches from concussion. You brought up concussion, so I'm going to piggyback on that. And riboflavin, magnesium and riboflavin for con headache concussion. Let's move on to our, to our next question. And let's move on to our next question. All right, here. Whoops. There we go. Okay. How can I help my body recover between games? So we talked about this a little bit, recovery. So why don't we start, let, let's go from the nutritional perspective again. Let's, let's start, let, this time let's start with you, Nicole, recovery. Okay, sure. So we're gonna talk about what to consume pre, during and post event or practice. So the pre-exercise meal provides energy for exercise and prevents the athlete from feeling hungry. The goal of this meal is to optimize your carbohydrate stores, which are your liver and muscle glycogen. So you can tap into those for fuel during prolonged exercise. So step one, pre-workout, make sure you're well hydrated. You know, drink water regularly throughout the day, but aim for about two cups or 16 ounces, two hours before exercise. Next, you wanna time your pregame meal so that it will be digested by start time. So if you have two to three hours before exercise, you can have more of a meal. It should be rich in carbs, but low in fat, fiber, and protein to avoid GI discomfort since these nutrients take longer to digest. I know when I have peanut butter for breakfast right before exercising, I'm burping up the entire workout. So it's a healthy fat, but not best right before a workout. Some sample meals for the teens, you know, lunch for school, you might want to pack a turkey sandwich with pretzels, fruit, and water, um, or a snack a couple hours before practice could be yogurt, granola, and fruit. Um, a breakfast before a weekend game could be pancakes or waffles with fruit and milk. So you see the greater emphasis here is on the carbs. Now, if you have one hour or less before exercise, like right after school before practice, your pre-workout should be smaller and more of a snack. You know, you want to choose quick digesting carbohydrate foods. This is basically a carb burst, so you burn food first for energy before tapping into your glycogen stores, enhancing your endurance. So you could do, you know, a quick piece of fruit or a fruit smoothie, a low fiber granola bar, um, you know, grain free, uh, I'm sorry, a grain snack like crackers, pretzels, and cereal. Or if you have trouble eating something before, you might want to try a sports drink for your carbs. 
Now, during exercise, consuming carbs can improve performance and endurance. So carb replacement is necessary for exercise lasting greater than an hour. You wanna consume 30 to 60 grams of carbs either in the form of food or fluids each hour during exercise over one hour. So that could be two to three sports gels, two to three cups of a sports drink. Um, I find the sports drinks are helpful not only for carbs, but also for fluids and electrolytes. You could also do you know, a, a quick digesting piece of fruit like a banana. And then your fluids during exercise, you should be having three to four cups per hour. Thirst should not be your only reason to drink. Coaches, you should be encouraging your athletes to drink as often as possible. Um, and plain water is fine for exercise that's under one hour. And then immediately after exercise, you want to consume carbs and protein. Carbs help replace glycogen stores and stimulate insulin, and protein increases muscle synthesis and decreases recovery time. You want to aim for 45 to 60 grams of carbs and uh, 15 to 25 grams of protein. So this could be two cups of low-fat chocolate milk. It could be a smoothie or yogurt. Um, I try to do food first, but for convenience, you could do a scoop of whey protein powder with a cup of milk or juice or a higher protein bar with a carb food. So these are quick options to have right after practice before you can come home for a meal. Then once you're home, one to two hours after exercise, a sample dinner would look like this, about three to four ounces of meat, a cup of starch, and a fruit and a vegetable should get you the right amount of carbs and protein there. And fluid replacement post-workout, you want two to three cups of fluids per pound of body weight loss through sweat during exercise. So that's your pre, during, and post-workout nutrition. Wow. Is, that, is that food glued onto the plate? Is that, how did, how did you do that? No, they're just my food models. <laughs> what about, you know what, like going back to sports drinks, because, you know, I, when I'm on the field and I'm on the sideline covering and you see, for example, high school sports, you know, drinking the sports drinks and, and cramping can be a big problem, right? And especially this could be an issue with athletes getting back to sport. And we know that potentially salt, they may be behind maybe their sodium uh, intake, even pre, uh, pre-activity, but many of the sports drinks have no salt in them. So what do you say? I know that do you, do you tell them to look for the few that have salt, or do you, do you recommend that they add salt to part of their diet or intake something salty? Yeah, so, you know, there's so many different sports drinks out there now, um, all with varying amounts of the electrolytes. Um, you know, I think there are still some, you know, Gatorades, Powerades, body armors that have a decent ratio of the sodium to potassium and chloride. Um, but even from food, uh, I know a popular soccer snack was always pretzels and orange slices. And that was for, you know, the sodium from the pretzels and the potassium from the orange slices. So they can get some of their electrolytes from foods as well. Um, like you said, you're really focusing in there on the sodium, potassium, and the chloride um, to help with muscle contraction and prevent that cramping there. All right, Chris. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris. Let's go, let's, let's go back to recovery. We talked to, started with a little bit before, maybe debunk some of the myths about recovery. You, you know, what works and what doesn't work um, in terms of uh, recovery? All right. So some of the big things that I know I've been getting questioned often uh, from my high school athletes is the use of the Theragun. Um, I, I think LeBron James uh, and Kobe Bryant might have been the big guys that kind of spearheaded this, getting the marketing out there. Um, but when we're starting to look at some of these modalities that we could use, um, you know, we got to be very careful about when we're using them uh, and what part of the healing process. Um, specifically, I want to look at the Theragun since this is one of the hot items right now for high school kids to go out and purchase. Um, they think that it's going to go ahead and get them recovered fast enough. Um, however, when we're using a Theragun, it's actually giving us a, uh, a percussion type of massage where it's actually beaten into the muscle, um, which can actually cause more harm than good if it's in an acute injury. So uh, having an injury within the first, when I talk about acute injuries, injuries that are, you know, are younger than 72 hours old. And if we're starting to put this uh, device onto them, it could really actually hinder recovery more than uh, help their recovery. Um, but some of the, the things, the techniques that are used uh, today that I know that work well um, is getting compression 
uh, compression sleeves onto to the injured area. Um, of course, icing, getting into an ice bath, um, doing a combination of an ice bath, cold water whirlpool to a warm water whirlpool. Uh, whirlpool. Uh, and of course, stretching, nothing can go ahead and help an athlete out more than stretching out uh, and spending quality time a day uh, to stretch. Uh, rule of thumb I have in Garden City, uh, every time that you go ahead and consume food um, and you're listening to Nicole and, and eating all your food, you should be stretching with that time. Um, so that way, every time you put something in your mouth, you should be stretching as well. Um, so that way you can't forget about it. Um, on, on top of that, um, also sleep is another important thing um, that we really need our athletes to get a hold of. Um, if they could take a 20 minute nap throughout the course of the day, that will help. Um, it just allows the body to reset itself. Um, and then the big thing with sleep is that we should get between seven to 10 hours of sleep a night, but at least the first, uh, the hour before you go to sleep that you actually put down the, the cell phone. Um, it's really um, plays an important role in your recovery system because you're so distracted to it um, that it keeps your brain activity going as you're trying to relax and recover. Josh, anything you'd add? Yeah, completely agree with Chris. Love it all. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think the only thing that I would say, you know, when, you know, recoveries, you know, and for all of us over the age of 40, we realize recovery becomes much more important in our, in our game plan. But I think, you know, there is definitely a lack of evidence for good recovery modalities. And I think the ones that have the, you know, you mentioned them, sleep, nutrition, and days off. You know, and when you get beyond that, you know, then then when you look at the evidence base for the rest of everything, you know, it's really kind of then then you start going into that iffy maybe category at best. But I think sleep is one that that's neglected and is huge in terms of recovery for all age groups. Absolutely. Bonnie, recovery. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, you, you read my mind, I was thinking about sleep is, uh, you know, having a consistent sleep wake cycle. And, uh, and, you know, scheduling uh, your day so that you, you're able to get to, to have a consistent cycle. Uh, but, you know, I, some, some people will set an alarm just to go to bed. I mean, uh, because, you know, it reminds them it's time to go to bed, you know, time to turn off whatever and, and just to go to sleep. Um, also, uh, you know, I agree with Chris, uh, not having tech, not using technology prior to bedtime, you know, two hours, at least two hours before bedtime is recommended, um, not to be, you know, watching the news, CNN, you know, just prior to bedtime, not to use technology. And, um, and the other thing, if you're, if someone's having trouble falling asleep, uh, you know, doing a body scan, a guided meditation of a body scan because the body scans uh, increase your awareness of your body and uh, where you might be feeling discomfort or, um, and it, it's just a, bo the body scan is very relaxing uh, at night. So it can, you can just drift off into sleep if you're having trouble sleeping. And it also stops those uh, racing thoughts and those to-do lists in your head. A body scan? Yeah, just mentally imagining, uh, you know, going from your head and relaxing, taking deep breaths and focusing your awareness on different parts of your body. And you can, some people like to start at the head and work their way down. Other people like to work from their toes up. Um, but, you know, just, you know, very, you know, laying in your bed and just being calm and relaxed and thinking about, okay, I'm re my, my relaxing my eyes and my face, my facial muscles my smile muscles, my jaw, and working their way down so that, you know, they can relax their whole body, muscle by muscle, area what, by what, area. What, uh, in your experience, what age groups can you, can understand that type of relaxation therapy is effective? I mean, can you- oh, Teens are great. I'm sorry? Teens are great. Teenagers are great. Teenagers, but yeah. you know that maybe an 11, 10 year old might not be as easy to, to convey those types of concepts or you can also do it in that age group. Well, I've done relaxation breathing with four year olds. You know, we put a little breathing buddy, a little stuffed animal on their tummy. They lay on the floor, they put a little stuffed animal in their belly and we say, okay, as you breathe, if your little animal goes up, then you're breathing the right way. And so we teach them how to breathe abdominally. So any age. 
That's great. Then I may need to ask you more about that technique that I might be able to use myself at home. The, uh, I'll get your breathing buddy. Thank you. <laughs> All right, moving on. How can I facilitate recovery for my team between games from a coach? Now we've really touched upon that with this last question, but maybe Chris and Josh, maybe you could talk about um, maybe again with this very shortened preseason, any recommendations for coaches in terms of practice sessions, time of practice sessions, maybe? Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. When we go ahead and look at our shortened season, um, many of us think that it's a shortened season. We need to get all of our X's and O's and plays in place. Um, and unfortunately, we're throwing too much for the mind to first off take in, so we're overloading our mind. Um, secondly, we don't need to be going uh, the full traditional hour and a half to two hour practices because it's going to be a shortened season. We want to go ahead and allow the kid to be able to optimize um, the best performance um, by not going ahead and keeping them there and keeping them in, in, in overdrive. Um, one of the things that we, we started here uh, a few years ago it was more so during our regents and uh, midterms was that we went to power hours in which we had an hour practice for the team to come in, get their practice in right? And then they're out. Um, that way the kids can go ahead and focus on their studies. Um, that power hour concept actually helped us um, throughout the course of our season so far, especially during our winter time, by getting the kids in and getting them out so they can go ahead and focus on what they need to do uh, to keep themselves at 100% uh, physically and also mentally as well. Fantastic. Josh, anything to add? Yeah, and I, I mentioned before uh, about cross-training and it, another benefit to that, if you had your student already implement the yoga technique or the Pilates technique, as opposed to doing these forms for increasing flexibility or increasing strength, you could utilize these as a form of active recovery. So in between these games, as opposed to having them practice more, which might, um, because of that repetitive nature, uh, might increase the potential for these chronic injuries, having them do a different form of activity, um, active recovery, which will still challenge the body, still keep that body nice and fit and active without taxing it too much to um, create these chronic injuries. So incorporating some other form of active recovery, physical activity that can help get them to still move to strengthen, but um, different than their sport. Okay, excellent. You know, so this is going to be our, our last question, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for a Q&A. So now's the time to, to write in your, your questions, this all-star panel here to answer them. So Certainly any questions that you have with relation, you know, related to getting back to sport, especially in our youth athletes, please, you know, write down, send us your questions now. And uh, for the last uh, 10 to 15 minutes, we'll just make this very conversational uh, and answering uh, a Q&A. So let's go to our last question that we have prepared and that's what role do athletic trainers play in supporting recovery and improving performance? So clearly I'm gonna turn that over to our athletic trainers, Josh and Chris, uh, take, take that away. This is a great question to end. Of course, it's a powerful question for us to go ahead and answer and how we're gonna be involved. Um, so when it comes to um, dealing with recovery and improving performance, um, the athletic trainers are, are very helpful in first off assisting with uh, our COVID protocols. Um, I, I think, in section eight, I've been on numerous calls with the athletic trainers from all other high schools um, to develop uh, protocols that we could use um, countywide. Um, being able to provide uh, the athletes and being here for the athletes to go ahead and be a, a sounding board for where they can go ahead and, and talk to the athletic trainer. Um, I was here at 630 this morning uh, in, in the, the athletic training room with the football players and most of them come in, they just need to go ahead and have the ability to speak um, to a member of the coach and staff, but not necessarily be the coach. Um, so being able to have the students come in with an open uh, open mind to, to speak to me and to give them guidance on what they can and cannot do um, has been great. Other things um, that can help improve in performance uh, would be, of course, sitting down together with the coach and staff 
um, as well as the athletic trainer and work together as a team to develop a protocol um, or a preseason uh, strength and conditioning program um, that could work for everybody. Um, it shouldn't just become from one individual. Uh, it should be a collaborative team effort uh, across the board. And just to add to that, um, coaches, you're, you're definitely on the front lines. Do you see your student athletes pretty much um, more than anyone? Um, and you potentially can notice differences in their demeanor, um, notifying your athletic trainer saying something's wrong. Athletic trainers are definitely a good source to triage and go to um, people like Nicole, nutritionists, as well as Dr. Mark, psychologists, to, to really make sure that we are comprehensively um, treating the student athlete, both mind and body. And if um, both of you can also talk to kind of red flags, potentially, um, that the common ones that, that you would see within a student athlete and would potentially want a recommendation from that would be beneficial. So with that, uh, you know, I'm going to give a shout out that I always try to do and that's to athletic trainers and, you know, having worked with sports, you know, all since finishing my fellowship, there's nothing more important to have a well-rounded sports program and for the health of an athlete uh, than having an athletic trainer on board. I mean, they are really the key to a sports medicine program. So uh, hats off to all athletic trainers. I think you guys and gals work unbelievably hard, are absolutely underpaid and uh, under-recognized. So, you know, again, hats off to you all uh, for such a great job, yeah. So with that, we're gonna go to a Q&A and I see we have some questions uh, coming in. And uh, how about, I'm gonna start with a question for Nicole and Nicole, the question, it kind of piggybacks a little bit what we were talking about early on, and, and that's about maybe people, athletes trying to drop weight too quickly and risk for maybe eating disorders, which are already prevalent in many of our athletes. Um, what are some signs, you know, how could we be more uh, on, on the alert for, for potential problems that might lead to significant and serious eating disorders? That's a great question. Um, like you said, you know, athletes looking to quickly get in shape for their season might be um, going about it in drastic ways to lose weight. Um, and Joshua, to piggyback off something that you had said earlier, I think athletic trainers uh, play a big role in spotting um, eating disorders. Um, some, you know, some red flag signs they might see, you know, at, here's where athletes might be skipping meals, you know, not having anything, um, you know, hours before practice you might notice them becoming kind of, you know, dizzy or faint or lightheaded during practice. Practice their performance starts to decrease. Um, at home, you know, parents might be able to see some signs, you know, that kids not wanting to eat meals with the rest of the family. Um, you know, maybe comments that kids are making about food starting to become fearful of certain foods or labeling foods as good foods versus bad foods. Um, so, you know, I think it's important. I think a lot of people play a role in, in picking up on those eating disorders and, you know, it's helpful if we can really capture them, um, at a, at a, in the beginning stages to really help them and realize how important food and fuel is for an athlete to really optimize their performance. Absolutely. Okay. Here's a question. Could you comment as to why young girls in soccer are getting a higher number of ACL injuries? versus their young male counterparts. Uh, Josh, Chris, you wanna start that? Or I could, I could take this one, or we could, I think we could all team up on this one. Why don't one of you guys start? You could start on that one. It, it, it's definitely interesting because in the dance realm, when we look at ACL injuries within dance, um, they're, compared to sports, we, we actually don't see as many ACL tears within dance. Um, and we don't see a gender difference um, between female dancers and male dancers. Um, so what can this potentially tell the sports realm um, in regards to ACL injuries is that dancers actually train for jumping for knee mechanics, and there might be a disconnect um, within the sports realm and um, the, the potential training for these knee injuries. So um, soccer actually did create 
a warm-up series. I, I forget what it's called, the FIFA... 11 plus. The FIFA, FIFA 11, 11, plus. 11 plus, which actually targets um, treating the uh, meme mechanics um, within soccer. And it might be that um, males that you are seeing, I, I don't know who asked the question, but males that you are seeing might actually be utilizing this warm-up program and the females that you are seeing might not be. So, and just to add on to what Josh is saying too, um, females are predisposed more to an ACL tear versus males due to just what we call the Q angle. So looking at their, their hips down to their knee, down to their ankle, um, in which uh, female just uh, genetics makeup is that they, they are wider at the, the pelvis or at the hip area, uh, which causes their knee to, uh, to be more uh, knock need or to go inward more, which predisposes them and puts them in more of the uh, risk for tearing or ACL. Yeah, so I mean, the interesting part about ACL injuries, you know, like, like the question, you know, for every male that tears their ACL, there's about four to five females that tear their ACL. And part of it is just about that, you know, the anatomical differences, but it's very interesting that most of these injuries are non-contact injuries. And they're just from landing, typically an awkward land, usually with the knee in a more straightened position. So it's the one time that we couldn't even say strongly enough to coaches, to parents, to athletes themselves, that these ACL prevention programs are wonderful, wonderful programs. They're available online. And the studies have shown that they really do make a difference. An ACL tear in a young athlete is devastating. It's a minimum of nine to 12 months off the field uh, that athletes losing their identity, um, taking away just what they enjoy to do, you know, at 12 months time and a young athlete is just an extraordinary amount of time. So these ACL prevention programs are just wonderful. Uh, 20 minutes, two to three times per week. Not only, not only do they help prevent ACL injuries, but they also improve athletic performance. So on multiple levels, they are very, very worthwhile. And all of our youth programs, both male and female athletes should be doing these ACL prevention programs, absolutely. Okay, our next question is how, and this is for Bonnie, how would you recommend incorporating mental health care into recovery at this point especially with the difficulties with increased anxiety and depression during this COVID environment? I think athletic trainers um, have a wonderful opportunity and, and Chris touched on this earlier to talk to athletes about mental health. I think just, just talking about it, bringing it you know, to the surface and, and, and normalizing it and destigmatizing mental health is the way to go. And I know the NCAA has done a lot of work with that. But, you know, there's a number of athletes who have uh, come out on commercial, you know, on TV and so forth saying, you know, it's okay to feel depressed. It's okay to feel anxious. You know, it's normal. So I think that anything uh, that I think that an athletic trainer can say, just say it's normal to feel anxious um, and, and, talk, you know, talk to someone about it, someone you trust, a teammate, a friend, um, your parent, uh, a coach, an athletic trainer. Um, I know coaches also have, I, I was watching a, uh, something on uh, ESPN the other day about a football player who had a drug issue, and he said his coach spotted it. No one else spotted it in his family, not his wife, no one, but his coach spotted it, and just the change in behavior. Um, so just you know, bring, I think just open, opening that up for discussion, you know, letting the athletes know that it's okay to talk about these things, that there's no reason to feel stigmatized by it. Because as, as um, Josh had mentioned, it's mind body, sports are mind and body. And, and that's the way life is also, but, um, you know, just feeling comfortable to talk to someone and having a support system. Um, having, creating, but opening it up for discussion, having talks. Okay, this one is for, for Nicole. Red flags from a nutritional perspective that coaches should look for that would warrant a referral maybe to an athletic trainer or a nutritionist. So similar, I guess, to the question that we spoke, that you spoke about before, you know, for eating disorders or maybe some other nutritional red flags. 
Yeah, um, any, you know, weight related issues, not just eating disorders, but if, if you know, a child might be, you know, overweight or, um, you know, have obesity, then that's definitely something that we could help with. Um, you know, if you know anything about their um, medical history, if you know their, if they have food allergies, we can help with things like that, celiac disease. Um, I am seeing a lot more kids and teens with high cholesterol and prediabetes. Um, so I don't know how much coaches know about their team's medical history, but, um, you know, we can help with any of those nutrition related conditions, um, as well as just, you know, helping them enhance their performance, even if they don't have any underlying medical conditions. Okay. To the group, um, any evidence on the effects of vigorous training done as a young athlete and will it affect them? negatively as an adult in terms of chronic injuries or problems and how to avoid them. And the last sentence, especially in dancers. Josh, I guess that means you're gonna start. I'm not really sure whether or not this question is in reference to strength training specifically. Um, the research on strength training within adolescents in general is positive. So as long as your athlete is training with a um, certified strength and conditioning specialist or with a coach and the um, strength and conditioning specialist and the coach is able to look at proper form, there isn't potential for increase in injury. Um, so definitely making sure that these sessions are guided as opposed to on their own. Um, if, if they don't have that guide, there, there definitely potentially can be an increase in injury. Um, and this is even in pertaining to um, dancers as well. The, the research on dance specifically hasn't been done, um, but similar premises, um, similar theory can be applied. Well, I think it's a really good point because years previous, there was concern about weight training, especially when the growth plates were open in young athletes and maybe risk for injury. And absolutely, just like you said, in the right control conditions and not using heavy weight, more repetition, proper form, that it's actually beneficial, right? There's neuromuscular benefits uh, to doing weight training. So almost you could say it with all age groups, it should be a part of their training and also can help with injury prevention. Now I took this question to think, because there have been some studies, but this is a really you know, interesting topic. When you look at explosive sports that people are doing, if you look at soccer, ice hockey, for example, um, is there an increased risk for like early hip OA, early hip arthritis in athletes who potentially sports specialize, do it day in and day out at young ages? And, and the evidence is pointing yes, that there is that risk uh, for early hip arthritic type problems. But I think right now, other than not sports specializing, we don't know how to prevent it. Yeah, and that's definitely why um, the National Athletic Trainers Association recommended not specializing in a sport early on um, to definitely incorporate as many different activities, um, sports, um, to, to keep the body nice and active. But it's, the, it's that repetitive motion, doing the same sport, doing that same motion over and over and over again, that potentially can create the increased risk for chronic injury. Okay, here's another uh... A uh, question for our athletic trainers, and this comes from a student athletic trainer in a high school setting. And the athletic trainer writes, one concerning topic has been hydration, as we were not able to provide water for the fear of COVID-19, and many of the water fountains were shut off in the schools. Have you come up with ideas on how to keep these student athletes hydrated during these times? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's definitely been a challenge in the high school setting. Um, one thing I'm sure you guys could see right over my shoulder is a bunch of Gatorade bottles. And no, I do not have any sort of endorsement or anything with Gatorade. Um, but just quickly to show um, with my football program, I actually have gone ahead and numbered um, each water bottle for the player to go ahead and have. Um, we do have a water fountain that's filtered. Um, their cap is actually numbered as well and also has their name on it. Um, as a way of doing hydration. It's uh, very time consuming to go ahead and get these things done. Um, but just knowing that I'm going out to a field with water um, can help. Um, just to add on to that, uh, as an athletic trainer, this is where we get to use our knowledge and think outside the box. Um, I've been fortunate enough to even get touchless water spigots for our coolers. Um, so the kid literally just needs to put the bottle up to it 
Um, and once it pushes it, it fills up the water bottle. Um, so hydration has actually been working. Um, it's just knowing some of the resources that you have out there and having that conversation with your athletic director and athletics department to go ahead and make sure you can go ahead and, and purchase that type of equipment. And dancers are pretty self-sufficient. Um, we definitely put the onus on them to bring their own water bottles from home. Um, so if worst case scenario, you aren't able to mitigate any barriers within your facilities, um, putting it on the athlete themselves, um, having them bring um, a jug of water, not just a small bottle um, to make sure that they're hydrated, especially if they're outside. Okay, well with that, um, it went so quickly. Uh, unfortunately, our, our time has run out. I first want to say thank you so much to the panelists. A wonderful, great panel, great information that you all shared with us. Thank you so much. And then I'd also like to say thank you to all of our participants. You know, it really means a lot that you tuned into this. This has really just been a crazy time with this pandemic, and uh, we really all owe it. Uh, to ourselves, you know, to, to be there for our athletes of all ages, you know, hopefully there's there's a light at the end of this tunnel, things seem to be opening up and hopefully only positive things to come. And uh, let's get all our athletes back out there and try to do it in, in as safe a way as possible. And again, thank you so much to everyone joining us. And again, on behalf of NYU Langone Health, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. All right, thank you. Uh, echoing Dr. Cardone, I uh, appreciate all of the panelists and our attendees tonight. Um, at the end of the webinar, you will be directed to a survey. Feel free to uh, submit any feedback or comments or questions. Um, but again, the webinar is recorded. We'll share that link to the video as well as some helpful tips uh, to all registrants. Um, thank you all again and have a great evening. <laughs>